I want to introduce our amazing executive director, Robin Sebastri. Hey, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us. This is um, one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, the speaker series on the state of the Bay, where Dr. Gobler comes down and talks to us about the changes in the Bay, whether we're going in the right direction or whether we need to do more course correction in order to protect the health of the Bay. Uh, before we get started, I would like to recognize some of our board members that are in the audience today. We have Rihanna Quinrati, who is our Director of Development. And I would say all of our board members are volunteers, so they all have uh, real jobs, if I can say it like that. So all the time they spend here is very much appreciated. We have Wayne Horsley, uh, our director of what? advocacy. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks for joining us. We have Mark Murray, who's our director of governance. And of course, we have Todd Shaw, our fearless leader and president. I also want to recognize the Creek Defenders who are with us today. We have Ed Reagan, who runs the Day in the Life section of our program. <laughs> Day in the Life brings uh, students out onto the creeks where they do water quality testing. It's an amazing program run by the DEC, the Pine Barrens Commission, and uh, Brookhaven National Lab. So they bring hundreds upon hundreds of students each year out onto the creeks in the fall, actually right now in September and October. And we piggyback on that by doing the water quality testing as part of that program in the spring. So we're really excited about that. Next, I'd like to introduce Janet Soley. Janet runs our debris data collection. She has helped us team up with the Ocean Conservancy to collect data uh, using the Clean Swell app. So every time we go out and do a cleanup, we collect uh, data on what we're collecting, uh, so what we're picking up. It could be straws or fast food things or uh, water bottles, but it allows um, the data to be housed in a central database and used by policymakers when they're looking to create policy like plastic bag bans or uh, five cent recycling um, programs. So thank you very much for that, Janet. Janet also serves as the president of the Friends of Connecticut River and our Connecticut River Creek Defender. Then I'd like to introduce uh, Walt Meschenberg. Walt is being recognized next week at the Bivalve Ball out in Mastic Beach for all his work in the Mastic Beach area, bringing students and the local community together to protect the Powder Squash Creek and the four other creeks that run through that area. Thank you, Walt. Thank you. Uh, Andy Michelle is our West Islip Creek Defender. He also runs the Great South Bay Oyster Project and has been instrumental in rallying up the West Islip community. So thank you, Andy. <laughs> and of course, Todd has already mentioned, but Tom Kane is our Bayshore Creek Defender as well as leading up the entire program. So all, all this team is, uh, is an amazing is an amazing group to work with. I'm so proud to work with them. I'd also like to recognize the public officials who have joined us today. We have uh, Senator Phil Boyle. Thanks, Senator, for joining us. We have Bill Doyle representing Senator Wake's office. Thanks for joining us, Bill. And a very strong, another strong supporter of our organization, Kevin McCaffrey, the presiding officer of the Suffolk County Legislature. Kevin gets out and gets down and dirty with us on our Creek Defender events. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Christmas, Kev, Christmas. <laughs> Let's get the, uh, the county emails fixed first. <laughs> oh, that was meant in a funny way, not in a... <laughs> and then we'll, then we'll gladly have, welcome you back. <laughs> we, know you're, we know you're very busy right now. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Chris Gobler. He is our speaker for today. We are thrilled and honored to have him here. Uh, Chris runs the Gobler Laboratory up at Stony Brook School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. He's been a long advocate for water quality and um, nitrogen uh, pollution, in, not a, an advocate for nitrogen pollution, but an advocate for solutions to nitrogen pollution uh, in the Great South Bay. Nitrogen is the number one um, issue that affects the bay, it causes harmful algal blooms, which in turn um, decimate the, the wildlife, that, that the marine life that lives in the bay. So I'd like to welcome you to the podium, Dr. Gobler. Okay, good morning everyone. How's everybody doing today? 
Good. Good to see everybody. And thanks for having me. This is always a fun event and, uh, and an excellent location. So uh, a pleasure to be here. And I have my, actually, I have my, my son joining me today. Um, we were supposed to go to the Yankee game last night. It got rained out. So he gets a day off. We're going to the game today. <laughs> and he gets to see his dad uh, uh, talk about boring science. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, well, I'll just start, of course, by acknowledging all the people who work in my laboratory. Uh, they're really the boots on the ground, the uh, fins in the water that make it all happen, and you know, wouldn't be here without them. Uh, and if you're interested, you can always follow what we're up to on social media. Okay, so just start with the general premise that we're all aware of, but no matter where we go, of course, Long Island, the entire island is a watershed. Um, and that's doubly important for us here in Long Island, of course, because our groundwater is our drinking water, right? So that means any activity on land is having a direct effect on our health because we're, you know, even it's often, you know, people can say, oh, well, I drink city water, right? Or I, you know, which of course doesn't exist. But even right. if you have Suffolk County Water Authority water, your water supply on average is coming from just a couple of miles away from wherever you are. So we're all affecting what becomes our water supply. Uh, and so any activity on land is directly affecting the water we drink. And of course, you know, we live in a county, thankfully, where we have excess water in an aquifer. So the, 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 the second issue, of course, then is whatever we don't extract to drink is discharging into our surface waters all the time. So all the activities on land are affecting our health via drinking water and affecting our surface waters uh, via groundwater discharge. And we know how things have changed over time in the county uh, with regards to population growth, and then also specifically the concentrations and levels of nitrogen in our groundwater, which continue to rise uh, over time. Uh, and the concentrations are relevant. So you'll see here the average 3.8 milligrams per liter this figure here came out of a study by Duke University that came out just a few years ago where they looked at literally the drinking water of the entire country. So if you look at that y-axis, that's millions of people. So that first bar there tells you that over 200 million people in the United States have drinking water with nitrate that's less than one milligram per liter. The average in Suffolk County at 3.8, we're far above that. Now, in good news... 3.8 is below the EPA standard of 10 milligrams per liter, and that was put in place uh, to prevent something called blue baby syndrome. Right? So we're far away from that. But, you know, I, at Stony Brook University, in addition to having a uh, school of marine and atmospheric sciences, one of the few universities that have a marine science school and a medical school. And actually, over time, I've been interacting more and more with people in the medical school and epidemiologists. And they've made me aware of emerging research, and I have a bunch of citations here, that even moderate levels of nitrate in drinking water have been found to have an epidemiological association with elevated rates of different types of cancers, right? And I, I won't go through the mechanism in too much, but you, we all probably know, like, oh, we probably shouldn't eat too many hot dogs. Well, why is that? They're preserved with nitrates and nitrites. And in your body, they get converted to something called nitrosamines, which then can become carcinogenic. So for even for, again, the public health stand point of view, we want nitrogen in our groundwater as low as possible to protect public health. Okay, so I mentioned beyond the rising nitrogen and the health issues, there's also the effect on surface waters. And so this is an image from the Nature Conservancy that just sort of make, visualizes that connection, right? That... The, what's happening on land is getting into the sea, and you know there's been the studies are are in. You know, a decade ago we'd say, oh, not rising levels of nitrogen. How is that happening? Well, there's been now you know almost more than a half a dozen studies, probably getting to ten different studies that have been done that have shown that you know almost no matter where you go, the main source of nitrogen in our groundwater is from wastewater. Um, you know, there's a little sliver what we would call sub-watersheds maybe on the east end where that's not the case, but for most of Long Island, that is the case. Um, even for the north shore of Nassau County, the main source of nitrogen to groundwater are on-site septic systems. Um, and I should say that on-site septic systems is, is the really the, the big source to it, not uh, necessarily sewage treatment plants. 
And so that has ramifications. And I don't know how well you can see all this. I'm going to show a blow up of this momentarily. But this is a map that I just finished putting together. Um, essentially, it's just showing the occurrence of what we call harmful algal blooms uh, and low oxygen conditions across Long Island uh, and where those occurred. But importantly, where these occurred from June to September. So this isn't, a, you know, decades of data. This is a four-month snapshot. You know, just to show you, and I, I do this map every year, and it's frankly not very different. I mean, the, the, the locations change and the, the actors change, but, you know, the overall takeaway that there are harmful algal blooms in the South Shore, the East End, the North Shore, um, you know, there's two dozen dead zones here of low oxygen and 20 sites with blue-green algae and freshwater. Um, you know, that's not far off from what we usually see. Uh, and we saw a great propensity for fish kills this particular summer, particularly during the heat of the summer. When it gets hot, auction levels are low. And we saw multiple harbors across the north shore of Long Island where every night the auction levels were getting to zero. And with that, fish kills. Okay, so here's a blow up of Great South Bay just to highlight a few of the events. So the blue circles are areas where we measured oxygen that went below the DEC standard of three milligrams per liter. Um, you can see several fish kills across the bay as well. Uh, and, and I will say this is by no means comprehensive, right? This is just things that get reported. Um, and then two different or three different types of harmful algal blooms. Uh, and I'll go into some detail, particularly on the one uh, momentarily. But on the harmful algal bloom front, you've probably heard me talk about them before, but we can generally break them into two different classes. Uh, the group on the left that are the kinds that make biotoxins that can be a human health or, or animal uh, threat, and then the ones on the right, which we would call ecosystem disruptive, that, you know, in good news, not a health threat, but in unfortunate news, can lead to fish kills or deaths of bivalves. And so what we saw this year in Great South Bay differed from previous years in that we saw a particular type of what we call a dinoflagellate that was almost consistently present through the summer in Great South Bay. Uh, it's called gymnodinium, and I have a picture of it here, um, similar to some other pictures as well. It forms, it's unlike in the past where we've had brown tides where the whole bay is brown. It forms sort of these patches, uh, but we saw it all across, just going back to the image here, saw it essentially from Bayshore. This is, I cut it off. It, it actually goes into all the way through Bellport as well. The, the reason Bellport is hard to see is because there's actually something else that was showing up there, and the, the two colors are blending. Um, but really across the entire North Shore, most commonly in Sayville. Um, but again, week after week in these different locations. Now, this is not a new species. We've certainly, or general, we've seen it before uh, here on Long Island. Uh, and this is what a micrograph of it looks like. Um, but it is has a notorious history, so I just want to bring up a prior event. Um, so in 2015, there was a massive fish kill on the East End. Um, and there's some images of that here, and you know, estimated over 500,000 fish. The epicenter was in the far western part of Flanders Bay in the Peconic River. And it was so large, it was actually a report commissioned by Suffolk County to look into you know, what were the causes here that brought together different agencies, USGS, DEC, um, of course, Suffolk County, myself, bringing in all the data that was available. And the major conclusions were, one, well, auction levels got really, really low, almost down to zero. But the other one was the presence of this exact same genus, gymnodinium, that was present during the fish kills as well. Uh, and... If we look, I'm going to skip through this, and I'm not sure how well this is going to show up here. But part of this study was actually looking at the gills of the fish. Now, here is what a normal fish gill lamellae looks like. So, as you may know, the gills are the lungs of the fish. That's how oxygen exchanges back and forth. And they have these finger-like projections, which are perfect for gas exchange, right? So oxygen would flow in and out, and ammonium can flow in and out as well. What happens during one of these blooms, however, is those lamellae, two things can happen. One, the lamellae can actually get destroyed, but two, the fish actually begins to suffocate because one, 
The dinoflagellates start to irritate the gills, and the fish causes mucus. And then two, the dinoflagellate gets so dense that it gets caught up in the gills. And so if you look here, what you see is this mucus layer, and then all the dinoflagellates in there as well. So the, beyond the fact that there was hardly any oxygen, all the fish had compromised gills as well. So now, thankfully, that wasn't the case here in Great South Bay this summer, but that is the history of this alga and something that we, um, you know, hopefully won't happen again. Now, again, that was in the Peconic River, so this would be something to look out for in those creeks uh, along Great South Bay. Okay. I spoke about this a little bit last year, but we have some new data uh, on this, so I did, hopefully, I, did, I hope these images are, are clear to everybody, uh, and uh, you can see what the water looks like there, and clearly this is not what we want Great South Bay to look like, right? And so what this is, is a, uh, a new seaweed-based harmful algal bloom that's been occurring in Great South Bay, um, and it's called Daisy Siphona japonica, and here's some more images of it, uh, and so what it is, it's, it's a red seaweed, but in certain stages of its life, particularly if it's starting to decay off, it starts leaching these red pigments. And you can see what the water looks like in that particular case. Now, ironic enough, you've heard the term before. I'm sure we all heard the term red tide. This sure looks like a red tide. But, you know, red tide is usually these little microalgae like I showed with gymnodinium. This is actually a seaweed leaching its contents into the water. And what I'm going to show you is that it's not, it, not only does it look bad, but it's actually what's getting leached out is dangerous. And I'll show you why momentarily. Uh, and in fact, ironically, Robin, it was a year ago when I gave my State of the Bay report that concurrently there was an event happening, I think it was at Hexer Park. And that you, I think you had sent me this image or someone from that day sent me that image just from uh, one year ago. So... A few things about seaweeds in general. One is that, you know, that water doesn't look good, but an overgrowth of seaweeds can be a human health hazard. So there's an article I'm citing here that was in the journal of The Lancet. Well, that's the second most impactful medical journal on the planet. Um, and what they reported was uh, cases, in this case was in the Caribbean, of literally thousands of people going to the emergency room I think it was 10,000 people over eight months because of accumulations of seaweeds. Now, the, and the problem is that decay state. Right? The seaweeds on their own are, are probably not a problem, but when they overgrow and then begin to decay, they can release something called hydrogen sulfide. And that's actually just frankly a toxic gas. Uh, and at high levels, again, in that particular case, in the Caribbean, uh, the seaweed there is called sargassum, led to thousands of people going to the emergency room. Um, and in other parts of the world, in Brittany, France, and in China, there's also been health issues with the overgrowth of seaweeds. So that's the human health part. But just to talk about this particular seaweed, if you look at this genus and species, it's Daisy Siphona japonica. And that japonica is for Japan. It's actually native to the Pacific Ocean. So not only does it look bad, it's actually an invasive seaweed. It invaded Europe uh, at the end of the 20th century. And actually, the first sighting ever in North America was just in 2007. So it hasn't even been on this side of the pond, so to speak, for very long. Um, and the, the first sightings in New York were actually here uh, across Great South Bay. And so this is a survey. We published this paper in 2021. And I should just say, for anybody interested, probably a few people, but if you were uh, interested in the science, we make all of our publications uh, freely available. So you could get and download any of these uh, to, to look at the data. But you can see when we did the survey, this seaweed was found all throughout Great South Bay and also in parts of Mauritius, Shinnecock, and the Peconic Estuary. And the question would be, why would it be here? Right, it, you know, it showed up just suddenly in one place. Why is it suddenly colonized, uh, particularly the south shore of Long Island? We did experiments specifically looking at what's the effect of nitrogen on its growth rate and the effect of CO2. CO2, of course, is a climate change gas, but it also can be created by excess of nitrogen when you get high levels of algal biomass that decays. The uh, breakdown of that can result in CO2. But regardless of the source of the CO2, what the study showed is that there's higher levels of growth when exposed to more nitrogen, higher levels of growth when exposed to more CO2, and higher levels yet when it exposed to both things simultaneously. 
We also, during that study, and when we surveyed the algae, collected samples of the algae all throughout the South Shore. And in doing so, we did something, we looked at the type of nitrogen in the tissue, and specifically the isotopic signature. So I won't get into the details here. But essentially what this does is it gives you a, um, it gives you a sense of where the nitrogen is coming from. So, for example, fertilizers give a negative value for nitrogen. Wastewater gives a high value. So if it's pure wastewater, a value of around 10. So here's the survey results. And what you can see in those results is that we're getting almost a pure wastewater signal here. In some cases, it's a dead match. In other cases, the worst case scenario is that 75% of the nitrogen is coming from wastewater. So we have an invasive species that grows faster when you give it more nitrogen. And the seaweed itself is telling us, yeah, we're getting the nitrogen from on-site wastewater. So essentially saying that, that that wastewater is fueling the growth of this organism. And again, looks bad, but unfortunately it doesn't end there. We did assays. These are assays that are sort of the gold standard using medical well plates, one fish per well plate to understand what's the effect of this decaying seaweed. And what you can see is that while our control fish all live over a week period, and just a couple of days of exposure, small larval fish begin to die and very few survive uh, exposure over an extended period. We also looked at the effects on larval clams uh, and the outcome was similar. And interestingly here, uh, it looks like some of the labels were lost there. One is the control, one and four are the controls, two and five are the living seaweed. And then you can see what the decayed seaweed effects are. And I think this is growing them with and without uh, an elevated food source. So it looks like in the Mac PC conversion, a few things were lost. But you get the idea. Again, this decaying seaweed significantly depresses the survival of hard clam larvae. So why would that be? And again, thankfully at Stony Brook, a very large research university. So the opportunity to collaborate with all sorts of people. So we looked specifically at what's in that decaying seaweed. And we looked at that using liquid chromatograph tandem mesh spe spectrometer. Um, which is shown here. And in all of our samples, so we selected all sorts of samples from the field, generated in the lab over and over again. When you do this mass spec, it essentially spits out these sorts of different peaks. And you get lots of different compounds that come out. But there was only one compound that came out specific, uh, consistently across all of the samples. And this was this compound that's called calerpin, right? It's found in other seaweeds. In fact, there's a seaweed called calerpa and it was first isolated there, but also in this particular alga. And this compound in the literature would tell you that it is toxic to fish and shellfish. So we think this is at least one of the reasons that this seaweed is having the ill effects it's having on marine life. Now, this summer, Robin was sending me lots of pictures uh, about a seaweed that was growing all throughout Great South Bay. And so here's an image from Ocean Beach. And if you can see that, it's growing pretty... Um, uh, pretty robustly along the shoreline. Now, we actually collected samples from that. It is not daisy siphona. We're doing, and, I'd be, and we're, I have an idea of what it is, but we're doing DNA sequencing to get a sense of what it was. But it looked like it was spread in many places throughout Great South Bay. So we want to get a better sense of what this is. Uh, and it may be just a purely, um, hopefully it's just part of the natural mix. But but clearly, this, any overgrowth of seaweed like this can be problematic, right? Because, the, you know, the next step could be that it dies off, it washes on shore, uh, or dies off and leads to low oxygen. Okay, so just giving a quick overview here, I won't belabor this long, but we have a great map in, in the back there showing the Gilgo Inlet in 1888. And so what we all know about that is that the South Shore inlets are ephemeral. Right, they come and they go, and I already spoke to some people that, you know, unfortunately, it looks like the new inlet in Bellport uh, is maybe going. Right, it came with Hurricane Sandy, maybe closing, and that's just part of the natural cycle. Right, that's just the way the South Shore works. I think the estimate is that there's been, um, I don't, I think there's, I'm going to get the number wrong. I think I'll just say I think it's correct to say dozens of inlets over the last several hundred years, uh, and only a few have remained because they've been stabilized. So I bring that up because. In the 50s, in Marich's Bay, there was no inlet. 
and so that was an entirely closed bay. And between that and duck farms, there was a history of green tides that uh, ended when the Mauritius Bay Inlet opened, more flushing, and the uh, duck farms were on retreat. Um, we then had a 25-year period across Long Island where we had record, no harmful algal blooms, uh, record-setting hard clam landings in New York State. In fact, you probably know the quote, two out of every three hard clams eaten in the United States came from Great South Bay. Uh, and the highest levels of scallop landings in the history of New York as well. Since that time, we've entered an era of ongoing different types of harmful algal blooms that have showed up um, and in many cases have had detrimental impacts on those fisheries. For example, the brown tide we know led to the initial collapse of the scallop. Repeated brown tides have really inhibited the recovery of the hard clam. Uh, and we know that excessive levels of nitrogen can both stimulate the growth rate of harmful algal blooms and or can make them more toxic. I don't think I'm going to have time to go into the details, but several of the toxins in these harmful algal blooms are nitrogen-rich compounds. More nitrogen allows the organism to make more of the toxin. Okay, just a quick sidebar to talk about climate change. Of course, the signs of climate change are all around us. They're, they're, it's, uh, you know, I think maybe when I was in graduate school, I, I began to learn about uh, climate change at the end of the 20th century, and uh, I always tell people, everything I, that was forecasted when I learned about climate change for the first time in the early 90s is coming to fruition today, in fact. And so we know it's happening, for example, with temperatures. Um, this is a plot of temperatures since the turn of the century for Long Island Sound. Um, I think I don't have more on that, so I'll just leave it up for a moment and just say that, you know, there's wiggle to the data. We get warmer years and colder years. Four of the warmest years in the, since the turn of the century have been in the last seven years. Um, and if you look at the data set, we started, Long Island Sound started the century with temperatures around 20, 21. Now, every year, we're at 23 and a half. Uh, and that's centigrade, by the way. And on the one hand, that might not seem like much. Uh, the, and these are, I should emphasize, these are average July, August temperatures, by the way. Right? So the fact that the temperatures are rising at this, and, and also... Uh, important aside, this is four times the global average, right? So that you can go to places in the world where the actual temperatures have not changed. There are parts of the world that are cooling and have been cooling this century, right? There's other places that are cooling, that are warming, but at a low rate. This is four times the global average. So this is like this two degrees increase. Well, you know, there are parts of the world where that's what's expected the entire century. We just had that in 20 years. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be necessarily something that's going back. And the, the reason that this is important seasonally, that is summer, is that re recognize that's where we hit our peak anyway. So all the resident organisms, you know, they're adapted to or had been adapted to whatever the peak had been. Now they're beyond that, and that can have consequences. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, the implications of that. I'll just say when it comes to climate change, we think about temperature, but there are other attributes to it, oxygen, something we call ocean acidification, and also harmful algal blooms, which in the past I've been known to call the four horsemen of the ocean climate change apocalypse, by the way. Um, but I just want to briefly talk about the scallop fishery on the east end of Long Island uh, as an example. So on the east end, we do see blooms of this organism, Cochlidinium polycricoides, and this is an organism that we had never seen on Long Island. So an, an example of something that changes as temperatures change. This map shows the change in the bloom season for this organism that has happened just this, uh, I think, since the year 1982, right? So the bottom line is we never saw this organism. We've warmed up a lot, and now this organism has the opportunity to form blooms for several months during the summer. Uh, and we've shown that it grows faster with more nitrogen, and we've shown that it is lethal to scallops. So this is just a map showing temperature changes now um, color-coded, but essentially showing here for the east end of Long Island how temperatures have changed uh, since the year 2003. And you can see 
significant increases uh, in temperature. Not as much, actually, as Long Island Sound, uh, but still uh, significant. And importantly, warmer water holds less oxygen. That's a law of physics. That's why we see fish kills in summer, and we don't really usually see them in winter. When you hit those peak temperatures, the oxygen levels just, again, as a law of physics, get lower and lower and lower. And just a, addition, a little bit of additional disturbance uh, can lead to those oxygen levels getting to dangerous, uh, what we call hypoxic levels. So this is just an example to show what happens when you have high temperatures and low oxygen. So this is survival of scallops uh, over just a four-day period. And so what it's showing is that the scallops can handle high temperature. Um, if they, can, they do just fine at high or moderate temperatures so long as the oxygen is good. They can actually handle low oxygen as long as the temperatures are okay. But if you give them both conditions, that's game over. Uh, and in fact, there's a few ways to look at this data, but an experiment where scallops were put out at different locations, um, they all died in a location in Flanders Bay when the temperatures exceeded that same mortality limit at the experiment and the oxygen levels were low. Everywhere else, they all survived. And I should say this was during an eight-day heat wave as well. Um, and that's become a big issue in marine ecosystems. We call them marine heat waves. So... You know, all these things need to be looked at collectively. Warming temperatures, rising nitrogen, harmful algal blooms, and low oxygen all together having impacts on marine organisms. And, you know, so the scallops are on the ropes, frankly. There's no other way to put it. You know, and hopefully things will go well. What's interesting, and I didn't even know this until my PhD student did an investigation of this, there are two different um, commercially important fisheries for the scallop in the United States. Argopectin aradians aradians is the fishery that we have. It extends from far north, Maine, down to New York. South of us is a southern fishery. It's a different strain. So we're at the southern limit of Argopectin aradians aradians. And just... In the past, the last time we were at the southern limit of an important shell fishery, it was the lobsters in Long Island Sound. And, you know, we warmed, I showed you what the warming's been in Long Island Sound, and that lobster, those lobsters have never come back. Um, and so being mindful of changes in climate are important. Okay, shifting gears momentarily. Just want to make a note of this paper that just came out that I think is very, very important. You can see the authors. They're from Stony Brook and from the U.S. EPA. And they looked at how does water quality affect home values, right? And so they took a clear-eyed view of the data. They collected the water quality data over 40 years from Suffolk County Department of Health Services. And they got home sale values all throughout Suffolk County. And they put together a series of economic models and I'm just going to get to the punchline. With one foot of increase or decrease in water clarity, home values are strongly affected. If you see the stars there, that's high statistical significance in their model. And so just to decode it for you, the very top yellow bar, w, the WF is waterfront homes. And that number is that the home value can change by $30,000. If you are, that's the difference between living in, uh, in front of water that's clear, clearer by one foot compared to murky water. And it's not just the waterfront homes. If you, everything else is the distance from the waterfront. So even if you live 2,000 meters away, and that's, you know, getting past a half a mile away from the water, that can still have a seven to $8,000 effect on this, the sale value of your home. So, you know, of course, everybody wants clean water, but this essentially is showing that, you know, we all have an economic stake in this. Uh, and, and even beyond that, if you look at the non-waterfront, one of their models even showed being further than 2,000 meters away still had an effect on home values. Um, you know, so given this is thousands of dollars, I think this is something that people would want to take note of. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm doing good. Okay. So, in the past, there have been efforts to mitigate nitrogen loading 
uh, in New York. And one of the places where this occurred and was spectacularly successful was in Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound, going up until just um, at the turn of the century, had one of the largest what we call dead zones in the United States. Right, an area where the oxygen levels get so low it can lead to those fish kills that I referred to before. Well, in the 90s, the EPA came in, got New York and Connecticut and the other states in the watershed together to come up with a plan. Let's reduce nitrogen levels in lo- going into Long Island Sound by 58%. You know, a very ambitious goal. And that was set. That goal was set in the 90s, and it was put forth all through... Uh, the late 90s and even into the beginning of this decade. But what's remarkable is the changes that have occurred because of that. And so you can sort of see that in this map here on the left. It's showing that dead zone and the frequency of the dead zone uh, in the 90s. And in the right, it's showing what it looks like today. Now, the dead zone is not gone. But you can see this entire stretch of Long Island coastal waters that are no longer experiencing the dead zone pretty significant area of compared to what it had been uh, before this change. And this figure got a little skewed here, but, um, but that's fine. You can see the trend. This is the nitrogen loading rate in blue and the size of that dead zone in red. Uh, and essentially what it's showing is that, you know, statistically, the, the correlation of these two things is remarkable. Um, and again, there was just a very important paper just published on this in Environmental Science and Technology by people from the University of uh, Connecticut using this data set. Um, yeah, somehow I definitely see this figure is a little skewed. I don't know uh, what happened in the translation. But you, you, even with the, the, the data being skewed, you can see what's happened, right? So essentially just showing that cutting nitrogen levels have had a dramatic effect on the sound. Okay. And so, in happy news, knowing that things like this are underway, uh, we live in a county where they're now taking on-site septic systems and nitrogen loading very seriously. Uh, And so, in 2020, the Suffolk County Legislature passed the Subwatersheds Wastewater Plan, um, which is an incredibly data-rich plan. Uh, If you have the report, I actually pull it up um, pretty frequently, and uh, it's literally thousands of pages. Uh, on the, what they, the science behind um, the overall plan. Uh, but the idea is that over the, by the middle of the century is to upgrade about 200,000 septic systems across Suffolk County. And it's not being done in a willy-nilly way. This is being done in a very targeted way. And this goes back to my very first slide, where they asked the question, how can we best protect public health to make sure that our drinking water is safe? And then how can we protect our surface waters? And so everything you can see in the hot pink are the highest priority areas for being upgraded. And frankly, it's all of Great South Bay, which is, you know, which is great. As, and, and so is the entire South Shore. These are shallow water bodies, right? And when you have a shallow water body, there's not a lot of volume, but you still have that same volume of groundwater going in. It makes them very sensitive. So they're looking to upgrade these um, these septic systems are all across the land, but you can see the South Shore is really probably the majority of them. Uh, and as you, I'm sure you're aware, there are multiple systems that have been approved by the county to be uh, installed. These systems can replace existing systems and get nitrogen levels down below 19 milligrams per liter, in some cases as low as 10 milligrams per liter. Another hat I unit that wear at the university is I direct the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology. Uh, where we're harnessing science to engineer clean water for the protection of public health and the environment in New York and beyond. And we've developed on-site systems. They're non-proprietary, um, so we're not a commercial entity, but we have been piloting these across Suffolk County. We've installed dozens of these, and they're based on a pretty simple principle of using sand and wood chips to treat wastewater. Uh, the wastewater gets delivered by something known as a drain field, that's overlined uh, a layer of sand and a layer of sand mixed with wood chips. And um, this figure shows the performance of various systems. The green systems are ones that have been approved by Suffolk County. The red ones are our nitrogen removing biofilters we developed at the university. Uh, Blue ones have not been approved yet. And importantly, the brown bar on the far right is what existing systems are doing. 
right? So you can see the enormous effect these systems can have. And, and I'm excited to say currently our what we call our, our lined NRB, nitrogen removing biofilter, is outperforming even the commercial systems. Uh, and they should be, those that, that particular system should be available for public install uh, by the end of the year. We also, of course, I mentioned we worry about what's in our drinking water. And so it's not just nitrogen, but there's lots of other things going down the drain that we don't want to be drinking. And so I can just say that our nitrogen removing biofilters can also remove 1,4-dioxane, which the EPA classifies uh, as a known carcinogen. And these two dozen compounds, drugs, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, that we don't want in our drinking water supply. And, re and the removal rates for these compounds exceed what you get out of a sewage treatment plant. This is the one system developed by Stonebrook. Correct. Yeah. And so, like I said, we have three different systems. Um, we expect by the end of the year, although with delays in Suffolk County, maybe it'll be next year. Uh, and I'm not, again, in the same, uh, I feel bad for the things that they, that, that, that cyber attack that they've had to deal with. Um, but two of our systems we do expect to be provisionally approved in short order, and we have a third uh, that is performing very well, and we uh, expect that to be approved in the coming year. Part of the technologies we're using, the, the wood chips, can also be co-opted onto existing systems. So we've made something called a wood chip box that we've attached to things like some of the um, uh, commercial systems, like a Fuji Clean system. And in some cases, the Fuji Clean systems may or may not be performing at the level you want. Certainly at 30, that's not at the standard. This is an example from a home in Wainscott. Uh, where the system's doing 30, but because we connected our wood chip box to it, the effluent is actually two. Uh, so it actually just gives that extra assurance and gets it even cleaner. Uh, and then the final thing I want to talk about are some in-water solutions. Um, for more than a decade, I've run a program called the uh, Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program in Shinnecock Bay. Uh, we published just in August our... Um, uh, I don't know, I was going to call it our flagship publication. I'm not sure what to, to call it, but the results of a decade of restoration. And so I'll just, I'll, you can see the highlights here, but in a decade, we've seen clam landings increase by 1,700%. And that's not like hyperbole, that's data. Uh, densities have also increased by the same amount. Uh, we had an expansion of, I believe it's over 400,000 acres, not acres, I'm sorry, 400,000 square meters, uh, 100 acres of seagrasses, um, and we haven't had a brown tide for the last six consecutive years. Um, so I could talk about this for a whole hour, <laughs> but I'll point you to my paper, and I think, uh, believe on my YouTube channel, you should be able to find some presentations on that, but it's a very... Uh, been a remarkable outcome and uh, something that's very exciting. And I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to emphasize this one too much, but there's actually more landings of clams in Shinnecock Bay now than in Graysout Bay, even though it's a tiny bay by comparison. Uh, and then the last thing I'm just going to mention are seaweeds that we've been doing a lot of work on in the last few years for as a remedial process. Um, seaweeds are great. They take up CO2. We have a CO2 problem on this planet. Uh, they take up nitrogen. Well, we've got a nitrogen problem. Uh, and they give off oxygen. Sometimes we have oxygen problems. Uh, and they even give off compounds that we think uh, can work against harmful algal blooms. In the last four years, we've grown uh, kelp, which is the first seed I'll talk about, at 15 locations across Long Island. The kelp grows. This is a winter seaweed, so we deploy it in the fall. And then it grows through the winter, mainly grows actually in the spring. Uh, but you have to put it out in the winter, but we're getting remarkable results. Kelp blades, sometimes uh, a dozen feet long, uh, and we're getting up to 10 pounds of kelp on just a foot of line. And we're putting out 200 feet lines, and as scientists, we put out replicated lines. So the bottom line is we're getting 1,000 pounds of biomass uh, per site, at least, uh, in just a few months. And when I say biomass, recognize that's 1,000 pounds, they've sucked up carbon, they've sucked up nitrogen, and they've pumped oxygen into the water. Um, and the amount of nitrogen, if you, we're, no one is at an acre scale yet for farming kelp, um, but people are getting interested in it. If you had an acre, based on what we're seeing for our 200 foot lines, putting them out in replication, if you had an acre kelp farm, you could remove as much nitrogen in just a few months 
as 8 to 18 septic systems, again, based on variability. Um, but that's a lot of nitrogen that can be removed. Uh, and they work against both ocean acidification and harmful algal blooms, as I mentioned before. But let me show you some data on that. So there's Mike Dole, who's really been leading this effort. And that's some kelp. And here's the other amazing thing. We're growing kelp in a, on, at mean low tide in Richards Bay. It's one foot of water. So Mike came up with a new method for growing kelp in shallow water. So literally, in a foot of water, we're getting 10 feet of kelp through the winter. Um, we also grow it in deeper areas, but the, you know, when we started this project, someone, we said, oh, we're going to grow it in just in Marich's Bay on the South Shore. People said, you're an idiot. That'll never work. Kelp only grows in deep, deep water. Well, actually, our best results have been in Marich's Bay. Um, but what I'm most excited about is the positive effects on organisms. So we've done experiments with growing kelp and oysters, and this data did, oh, there we go. Here's some data. Looks like the first part didn't quite show. Now, the pH part didn't show. They're helping the pH, but that's fine. They're also, uh, I see the other bottom labels aren't there, but that's fine as well. Here's an experiment. I'm going to have to walk you through it. One is the control. Two is growing them with kelp. Three is exposing them to ocean acidification. And four is the kelp with ocean acidification. And so three, ocean acidification, that is a climate change threat that has a negative effect on bivalves. The oysters grow slower. But if you add the kelp, you can remove that effect. And again, this paper is free online, so if you wanted to see the details, you're welcome to go explore that. Um, and then we also, on that Marich's Bay uh, oyster farm, the Great Gun Oyster Farm, we did experiments with the kelp where we grew oysters either literally in the lines of kelp that we had out. And in this case, we had not just three, but I think we had a half a dozen. So between the lines, next to the lines, or further away from the lines. And we'll see. Looks like, again, for some reason, oh, I know what it is. That's the high-frequency data. Didn't like that. So this, what this one would show you is that in the kelp, we see the pH is significantly higher than away from the kelp. So via the process of photosynthesis, the kelp is taking up the CO2. That negates ocean acidification, and it raises the pH of the water. And again, ocean acidification, low pH is bad for oysters. Um, and here are the results. Growing the kelp away from, growing the oysters away from the kelp, the control condition, they grow poorly with, or slower, uh, and that's because the pH is lower there. But when we put them either on, on the kelp, literally between the lines, they grow significantly faster. And even next to the kelp, they grow faster yet. We've worked with other seaweeds. I won't belabor this because I feel like I'm getting towards the end here. But uh, we've even used Gracilaria, red seaweed. And um, again, my labels are not showing up. I don't know why that is suddenly happening. But uh, you'll have to trust me. Again, the papers are free online. <laughs> Uh, and so you can page through the data. With just a couple of days of exposure, we can get the brown tide levels to essentially go to close to zero when exposed to this grassal area. So what's happening is these seaweeds have anti-fouling compounds. They're naturally, you know, this kelp is amazing. If it starts growing, you can have a rope out all winter. The rope is colonized by all these other seaweeds. If you've ever worked out in the winter, there's a seaweed called ectocarpus. Right? It's this slimy red seaweed. So the ropes are totally coated with it. And then the kelp, nothing on it. So the kelp has these defensive compounds, which only makes sense, right? It has to protect itself. It's a plant, and all plants have protective compounds. It's releasing some sort of protective compound that keeps the harmful algae away. And then uh, the last algae we looked at is probably the most dangerous of them all, uh, Alexandria, that makes this neurotoxin, saxitoxin. Um, and so the picture's worth a thousand words. On the left is what Alexandria looks like normally. That brown is its chlorophyll that makes it photosynthetic. On the right is if you expose that cell to the seaweed. And it's literally that cell is now spilling its guts. It is not happy. Um, and so we've done experiments where we grow... Um, that we get bloom water, grow it under normal conditions, add nutrients, or add the nutrients and add the kelp. And the kelp suppresses the amount of the harmful algae. And then the final experiment here, we, could, we 
grew mussels with the harmful algae, with and without the kelp. Now, the reason we worry about this particular harmful algal bloom is that the mussels can actually, they filter feed, take up the toxins, right? And that leads to something called paralytic shellfish poisoning, right? So we don't want that. But what we were able to show is that we can significantly cut the amount of toxin in the mussels by co-growing them with the kelp. And in fact, down below what would be called the closure limit. So with the seaweeds, this is my very last slide here, we have something that I call the halo effect, right? Seaweeds are not going to solve our climate change problems, right? And we're not going to coat our, all of our bays with seaweeds. But what I'm showing is that they have an important utility and um, almost a symbiosis, if you will, with shellfish and maybe even shellfish farms where they can oxygenate the water, they can protect against harmful algal blooms, they can combat uh, ocean acidification. Okay, so with that, I'm done. I'll just skip reading my conclusions. You can read them over, and uh, thank you all for your attention.